have the honor today of introducing this morning's keynote speakers, um, which I am really quite excited about. Um, Mayra Alvarez and Silvia Fernandez Quintanilla, who will be talking this morning about responding to the border crisis. Mayra E. Alvarez is from the Laredo, Texas, Nuevo Laredo, Tamaulipas border. Um, she is a PhD candidate at the University of Houston, and her research is on U.S. Latino literature with a specialization on U.S.-Mexico border militarization. Additionally, her research interests lie in the study of Latin American literature, Latino art, women's studies, digital humanities, archival material, and print culture. Currently, Mayra is the director of the Inter-University Program for Latino Research at Houston. She is co-founder of Borderlands Archives Cartography, part of the Torn Apart Separados team, and a member of the forthcoming team-based United Fronteras. Silvia Fernandez Quintanilla is a border native from El Paso, Texas, and Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua. She is a PhD candidate in the Department of Hispanic Studies at the University of Houston. Currently, she works as a teaching assistant in the Spanish as a Heritage Language program. Her research is on U.S. Latino literature with a focus on the U.S.-Mexico border, transnational and intersectional feminism, Hispanic archives, digital humanities, and decolonial and postcolonial theory. Among her DH collaborations, she co-founded Borderlands Archives Cartography, is part of the core team of Torn Apart Separados, and currently she is a member and coordinator of a forthcoming team-based initiative entitled United Fronteras. She has also participated in the making of a U.S. Latino Digital Humanities Center, as well as various projects with recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program. Please join me this morning in welcoming Myra and Sylvia to speak with us. Hi, good morning. Great. This is okay. Good morning, thank you so much for coming to the presentation. For um, the people that it's live stream or here, here's the uh, link for the PowerPoints if you wanna have access to it. And well, I'm Silvia Fernandez and my colleague Mayra Alvarez, we will be presenting Responding to the Border Crisis Digital Interventions and Transnational Partnerships. And first of all, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation, uh, as well as everyone here to be interested in our work. Um, I want you to take a look, first of all, to these two images. Um, probably you will be familiar with this image that was cir circulated through social media recent times. But I want you to see that this is in the present and the other image is from 1920. Do you see similarities? <laughs> A lot, right? So the issue with the border crisis is not something just of the present. It has been con continuously happening for centuries. And this has been a common view of the border in the past and in the present. Meanwhile, as border natives, um, Mayra Alvarez, who migrated to the Laredo border when she was a child, and myself, that I was born in El Paso, Texas, but I live in Ciudad Juarez, and every day I used to cross that border, these images are really problematic because they don't represent the border communities that we know. And these are becoming the stereotypes of who we are. <clears throat> the current and past national discourses about the border have continued to generalize, stereotype, and make invisible the complex history along the U.S.-Mexico border. Recent news present 
this region as an area of chaos, a border crisis. However, borderlands identities have emerged throughout history as a result of the loss of territory, immigration, exile, deterritorialization, deportation, transborder dynamics, divisions, as well as mechanisms of militarization. In here, you can see um, the thread on newspapers about the Mexican Revolution, in which they were telling that the border was going to close. They were persecuting the Pancho Villa and the revolutionaries. And here are the present discourses also giving this thread about a chaos on the border, the, the, um, that it's very scared who lives around there. With this in mind, I want you to take, consider the images and the discourses and relate that to other communities, to other regions that also have been altered, that have been stereotyped. And these questions will be, I'm gonna present them right now, but I want you to keep those questions throughout the presentation. How can digital humanities intervene in these kind of situations? How does social justice in DH looks like? Why the necessity to connect the global north with the global south? What are the challenges in these kind of projects? Why is it necessary to create, develop, manage projects that respond to, the social to these social issues? <clears throat> By creating critical digital humanities projects oriented towards social justice, in this case, through the use of archival material and public data with digital companions, it is possible to delve and reveal other notions of the U.S.-Mexico border in this case. I will discuss how incorporating humanities studies, in this case focusing in the studies of the border, to digital creation, scholarship, and innovation has been a key role in the production of critical digital humanities works that question the toxic political social discursivity that ger generalize stereotypes and invisibilize the history of communities along the Mexico-US region. As a result of these practices, Borderlands digital humanities are being created as alternative interventions to enact in liberating pedagogies and praxis. As can be seen in Borderlands archives cartography, bar, back, and torn apart separados, the projects that we will be discussing today. The kind of work creates a historical revision of the borderlands, decentralized the Mexico-US border crisis, and becomes a valuable intervention to humanize and decolonize the knowledge of the borderland regions and its communities. Additionally, these practices and projects are becoming an act of social justice activism that utilize technology and digital learning not only to put to the forefront collaborative and interdisciplinary work methods, but also to engage with various communities challenge the border crisis, encourage to know more about the complexity of this region, and transform production of knowledge that go beyond geopolitical borders by establishing bridges and alliances between the global south and north. And how can digital humanity, uh, going back to the first question, how can digital humanities intervene in this kind of situation? How does social justice in DH look like? When we met Mayra Alvarez and myself, we were like, it is frustrating that when they, tell, they ask you, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Ciudad Juarez, El Paso, where they kill women, or where women disappear. So it was like, yes, that happens, but that's not everything from my city. And it, it started the political discourses that talk about this negativity. And we were like, how can we do something that reflect other things of the borderlands? As we started working with archives, we saw this big collection of newspapers 
that represented the border the borderlands from different perspectives, not just the negative, but also the complexity of this area. And on February 2017, both natives of the borderlands, we founded Borderlands Archives Cartography in order to visualize, document, and analyze the junction of various cultures and histories of the border region before and after it became the current division line. By approximating archival material through the notion of Gloria and Saldua and Cherry Moraga theory in the flesh, alternative forms of historical documentation emerge, which allow a deeper understanding of border transitions and migration flows found in borderlands, histories, identities, and cultures. Back's transnational newspaper archive incite us to revisit and reinterpret history, creating a counter discourse responding to the past and current discourses that continue to alter the borderlands and its communities. Back uses a digital map to display the US Mexico borderlands by recording geographic locations of 19th and mid 20th century newspapers. This project is founded and financially sustained by Mayra and myself as, and is not affiliated to any institution, showing what can be accomplished when there is a personal commitment to an idea and little to no financial resources. So um, you can go ahead and uh, visit the website to interact with the map and the resources. <coughs> And I would like to start with why is it necessary to connect the global south with the global north? What are the challenges in this kind of projects? Why is it necessary to gather newspapers published in the northern area of Mexico and the US Southwest in order to understand the borderlands history? Since these newspapers are housed in archives located either in the United States, in Mexico, the archival material is not considered to represent a region that interacts between two nations and that has a shared history since its formation. This division has enabled gaps in borderlands archives that dangerously simplify its complex reality. Back integrates newspaper archives which contain publications about everyday issues local and binational businesses, advertisements, local stories, among other topics, documenting the communities of the border. As Nicolás Canelos indicates, publications on the U.S. side have helped individuals and communities protect their rights by fighting against segregation and discrimination, particularly after the cession of Mexican territory to the United States in 1848. Similarly, this helped maintain the languages and cultures, raising the education levels of the communities through the publication of creative literature. Newspapers on both sides of the border have documented various political, social, and economic processes from the colonial era to more recent events that contribute to the understanding of the region and its multidimensional cultures. And in here, the first image shows the archives that we have gathered, the newspapers, which represent an alternative form of working with archives. As I mentioned, this project is not funded by any grants. We're students. So our credibility, sometimes it's difficult, particularly we're working with institutions. Because when we wanted to approach to the archives, they wanted an institution that relied to us. So what we decided when we wanted to have access to archives from Mexico, being in a US institution was difficult. Or in the US, having access to newspapers from Latino communities, it has a lot of regulations. Sometimes the access to that, those are, uh, archives, you have to pay to have access to them or you have to be from that institution to have access to those newspapers. So what we decided is to give the locations of those newspapers that are in digital format. And what is mapped 
it's what it's available in a digital format. There's several other newspapers, but the, the, those are in physical form, which it's another thing that has to be worked out. But at the beginning, we were like, how can we work with different archives without um, dealing with copyrights, without getting all these archives with us? We didn't want it that. What we wanted is to spread the word of this material in order to understand the borderlands. As we have been moving forward, we have identified several institutions, several places that have these newspapers. Some of them, when we were presenting, they were like, wow, we didn't knew that this material was important for the borderlands. Now, these institutions are working towards the digitalization of this material to have access and to create other kind of projects. But that's, that has been the challenge, but also the, the reward of the project, of seeing that other institutions are taking a look at this material from other perspectives. In this other case, it's um, three of the examples of newspapers that we decided to create different historical periods in order to understand the newspapers. In the first part, it's the colonial period, which belonged to the borderlands when it was part of the Spanish territory. Later on, there are several newspapers that were published during the Mexican and US war. And lastly, there are the newspapers that are from the recent times. We stopped on 1930 because of copyrights issues. And we don't do, we didn't work before colonial times because if we're dealing with indigenous newspapers, they conceive the borderlands differently. So we will have to approach the communities however they want to be, however they want the material to be reflected. But that's something that we have been considering. When creating back data, our identities were fundamental. That is, as fronterizas, transfronterizas, it was, it was important for us to approach both sides of the border, conceiving the borderlands as an intersection that shares a common land through its historical, cultural, political, and binational systems resonates with Deborah Castillo and Maria Socorro Tahuenca decolonizing perspectives, and I quote, it is important to take both sides, the US and Mexico, into consideration or to be specific about which side one is going to talk about or study and to recognize the material and metaphorical differences involving such transnational analysis. Otherwise, the intellectual colonialism will be perpetrated to the detriment of both. This is crucial, relevant, and necessary in post-colonial practices when working with regions or communities from the global north and south. Thus, it is then important to rethink our habitat, home, city, country, world, not as a static place with people who enjoy fixed identities, but rather as dynamic territories and people with multiple identities. And in here, the first graph shows the transnational data that we have collected. You can see the titles of all the newspapers that we have gathered until now. Later on, it's connected to the historical period where they belong to according to our protocols. And lastly, it's connected to the state where they, will pu where they were published. And in here, that circle reflects an archive of the borderlands not a division, how it has been implemented in the maps or in the news. <clears throat> in this side, it's the contrary, right? There's a division. The newspapers that belong to the US and the newspapers that belong to Mexico. If we just look at it like that, it will impose the hierarchy that the US does more, more production of newspapers. Meanwhile, this is not the case. In this issue is that the newspapers housed in the US are digitized. 
in Mexico, they're not digitized, but they have a lot of that material that hasn't been contemplated to digitize. Also, a lot of the newspapers that are in the U.S. were part of when, they, when the territory was from Mexico and from the Spanish Empire. So that's the difference between that graph. By considering digital companions as tools that can aid us to expand the notions of the borderlands, back challenges the colonial imposition of maps, documenting the borderlands literary production visualizes its transnational flow and archival material. The use of a digital map incorporating newspapers from both sides aids to create new ways of mapping the territory. And when we gathered, when we gathered that data, we were like, we need to show it in another form. And a map was the best form for us because it would show the transitions of how the borderland has changed. And if you interact with the map, you will see that. If you click to a newspaper that belonged to the colonial period, you will see that the territory was far away from what we know about the borderlands today. If we take a look at the newspapers that are in the third period, you will see that it was a migration from newspapers from Mexico to the US, particularly during the Mexican Revolution, that a lot of newspapers went to the US side because of threats of not being able to publish in the Mexican side. And you can see different dynamics, but that's why we decided to visualize this in a map. And according to Anita Lucisi, the power of mapping is, not, is that there is so much power in it. It doesn't necessarily have to be oppressive. It can be liberating. It can be healing. It can be empowering especially when it's being used by people who have been historically oppressed. Additionally, Edward Ayers indicates that the digital maps allow us to see movement, manipulability, and specificity of the dynamic maps, give us a glimpse of what deep contingency may look like, like over time, by allowing us to see space and time at a distance in relatively abstract ways, the maps show us dissolving and crystallizing patterns. Otherwise, invisible in rows of numbers or static maps based on the same data. At the same time, GIS allows us to add other layers to question the hegemonic discourses imposing these geopolitical spaces. Certainly, with the use of the interactive visualization, it is possible to bring to the forefront several dynamics in the junction of complex identities, particularly from the borderlands that derive from the transitions of the geopolitical borders between Mexico and the US since colonial times until the current division line. And here, another aspect that um, we did different when creating the data to integrate it into the map is that we were based on the, court, on the addresses that the newspapers show us. So we went to the newspapers to take a look at the addresses. And what happened when we were gathering that data? We couldn't find a lot of these streets. The coordinates were not uh, available because a lot of these streets disappear, change their names. So it was that issue that the map is documenting the printing press in the borderlands. And that's something very rewarding because when you go to downtown or in a border city and you see a Chinese store, but once you go to the map of back and you see that address, it used to be a printing press. And now it's changing completely. A lot of these uh, places are not being recognized as historical um, places but it used to, there used to be a history there. A lot of printing, printing press gathered to publish newspapers during different times. So it's giving us another aspect to study what used to be the borderlands uh, in past times. So that's uh, something to also delve in that we haven't continued working because 
it's the distances to go to different border city, but the newspapers also gave us that part. To finalize, why is it necessary to create, develop, manage projects that respond to social issues? Borderlands Archives Cartography works towards a deeper analysis of the U.S.-Mexico border, its geopolitical tensions and transnational transborder dynamics. This project works as a social justice act since it breaches a shared history of this region between the global north and south. Back creates an alternative form of documenting the historical memory of the U.S.-Mexico border. By locating, mapping, and facilitating the access to this material, the project invites us to the public to value these primary sources, to inquire about the content of newspaper archives, and utilize digital companions in order to challenge the continuous toxic and oppressive discourses through alternative interventions. Um, lastly, what has been really rewarding from back is that we have been able to connect with the community. The, the back has been really accepted in museums, in small institutions, when, where they see the value of their material, where they see, wow, we can approach the communities through the material that we have he that we didn't consider it was important for the people that lives here. Or when people from an area and they're like, oh, I didn't knew that they published that much material in this area. So that has been the most rewarding about back that the communities from the border have been more aware of the value of their material and their history. Now I will let the word to Mayra to talk about Torn Apart. Oops. Okay. Thank you, Silvia. Um, so I'll be talking about torn apart separados in Spanish. Um, and you have the description there for volume one and volume two. And what I would like to start with is um, with the question, how does social justice and DH looks like when responding to border crisis. So, Torn Apart, Separados, was created as a response to the President Donald Trump's uh, zero tolerance immigration policy in 2018 and immigration incarceration in the, in the U.S. in general. And Torn Apart data visualizes, illustrates landscapes, fam the landscapes of families and communities Driven by the massive, um, driven by the by the, sorry, driven by the massive web of immigrant detentions in the United States, as well as the shadowy economic web that supports ICE uh, infrastructure. The use of public data and mobilized humanity practices allowed under <clears throat> allowed other interpretations, <clears throat> excuse me, of family separation, such as how is not just a Mexico-U.S. border issue, but a national one since detention centers are found throughout the nation, as we will see, and how this is a corrupt mechanism where the U.S. government profits from vulnerable communities by continuously de denigrating people of color. This initiative becomes a historical digital record that continues to work profoundly to review the border, again, crisis, in quotes because we'll see that, what, what is that referring to in reality? So this is the core team um, that began uh, this project, a group of librarians and scholars in the humanities from various universities across the nation, who with no financial support, dedicated part of their summer to develop a rapidly deployed ICE research. Committed to documenting the current migration flows to the United States and its migrations policies. So why the name torn apart, in this case, uh, separados in Spanish, which is what it means to be separated? Well, it was to transmit the message intended. 
families being separated. While the news re uh, replicated the president's border crisis discourse, we question its rhetoric since it terrorizes the public in order to validate a detention and immigration system, in order to distract people from the real problem, the national landscape of immigration detention. So, okay, let me go to the, oops. Um, so the constant news, and this is some of the images that you've seen in the media, but the constant news on family separations and children displacement throughout the detention system led us to create Torn Apart. And for a whole week, the team worked on the data gathered from barrier open sources, such as ICE facilities, public, um, pu public, publicly available list of CPP sites, data sets of ICE uh, detainee hearings, state children licensing database, government uh, grant awards list, and US uh, spending as well. We cross-check data from non-governmental sources as well, news reports about immigrant detention, business databases, tax documents for nonprofit organization, job advertisements, Google Maps entries, Facebook places, and more. So the challenge was to locate this data, organize it, contextualize it without altering its meaning, and verifying the data with other sources, as well as consulting each other constantly to prevent putting uh, at risk vulnerable communities involved. And among the various specializations that, um, that are found in Torn Apart, I'm gonna talk uh, specifically in of some of them. So let me go and get out of here. Let me see if I can get out of here. I don't have access to. And go to the, um, to the map so we can interact um, with the information. Uh, if I just put on the part. Yep. Well, that side, wait. <laughs> That's not what I'm looking for. Uh, yep. There we go. There it is. So the images I'm gonna talk about, the first uh, um, first are come from the volume one. And I wanna talk about the trap first, because this is gonna help us to understand this border crisis that is being talked about so often in the news and still you know, going on and still being talked about. Um, so for this, um, among the various visualizations, again, the trap visualizes border entries strategically located in main entries, while others are located in isolated regions um, that immigrants are forced to use when the militarized mechanism along the border are reinforced in the main ports of entries. While CBI and I were working on this data, there were various things to consider, such as identifying not only the pedestrian crossing and passenger vehicles, but the commercial ports as well. And when interacting with this visualization, you will see the names of the entries. So when crossing the border, in reality, the ports, this ports of entries are closed, that are closed are those who are the most uh, used by pedestrians and, are, and they are within the city. So what I mean is, I'm from the Laredo, New Laredo uh, border. So for me, for instance, um, crossing, the border crossings would be, and you can see as you, as you hoover along the, the line, you will see the different ports of entries, the official ones. So in Laredo, no Laredo, we have four ports of entries. One is a um, pedestrian crossing out of the four, just one, uh, pedestrian crossing and passenger vehicle. And the three others are passenger vehicles and um, commercial uh, use, which means import export. So trailers crossing all the time. And when you hear in the news, will shut down the border, they're talking about the pedestrians crossings and the passenger vehicles. They're not shutting down the commercial uh, entries. 
that the economy is gonna the economy is not gonna be affected by it. What is gonna be affected by it by this closures that have happened and that are still happening uh, is they're interrupting the dynamics of the local communities, right? There, there are people come and go to work, to go to school, to you know do their daily errands. They have to go to the doctor. Either way, in the U.S. or in the Mexico side, uh, that is what's being affected: the local communities. You know, creating traffic. You know, the traffic. Um, sometimes bridges are closed for three or four hours, so that makes lines that to cross it takes you four or five or six hours to cross. So for the local communities, this is the issue. This is what's not being talked about as well. That when the government is talking about shutting down the border, you know, it's to give this impression of, um, to terrorize in reality, uh, the communities and to terrorize the public in general. But what we're not talk talking about, what they're not talking about is, and I'll go to the next, um, image is this. This is the crisis. Detention centers found throughout the U.S. where families are being taken and being detained. Uh, so it's not this line that we're seeing that we are so familiar uh, because of the news, uh, but it's this. This is what, being, what uh, we are being distracted from because once, uh, uh, not only the, uh, the detentions happened, yes, they, there is a uh, crossing in the, in, the, in the border itself, but what, um, what is done afterwards, right, where those people are being taken, we don't know. It's all over the place. So this visualization, the clinks, if you, uh, again, hover over some of this um, dots, you'll see that they can be uh, detention centers, but they can also be uh, jails. So we have organizations as well, uh, uh, nonprofit organizations that do and perform the same um, job as any other detentions. So it's not only you know uh, families and children and individuals being taken to detention center specifically, it's just any place that is open and that is, that can take, uh, um, that can take them in, you know, temporarily. So, and also you will see that some of them are not, you cannot click on them, you cannot, they're not active because these are being activated in de and deactivated as time passes by according to what is needed. So that's another thing as well. And it's worrisome because why is this happening? Why some centers are being active or being reactivated when they were closed at one point because of he uh, health uh, issues, because of infrastructure or any other situation that they might have. So this is the border crisis that we should be talking about. It's uh, the, the system that is creating this and supporting these detention centers. And also you'll see in the information that you have a name of the place and you have other data as well that will be on the side as a graph in terms of you know, the incrementation of um, people being taken to, to those particular places, but we don't give the exact address of it. And this was some of the things that we had to talk about uh, because at that moment what was happening is, uh, it was when uh, they were talking about children being um, uh, that there were the children they didn't know what was happening with the children right that they were lost in the system so and you saw in the, in the news as well you know people going to the detention centers and protesting and blocking the passage to the the buses that were taking or moving moving the the, the families uh, from one place to another so we didn't want it to contribute to that we didn't want it to put at risk uh, or create more more um, trauma to the uh, to the communities you know that were facing this situation. So that's why you won't find the address. I mean, they're out there. You can look for them. You can um, search them. Uh, but at least for the project, we just that was not our intention. It was to visualize what was going on, right? 
So in terms of the second volume, I'm going to go to one visualization in particular. Again, there's many others that you can explore, interact with, you know, and it will give you different um, information and data. But connected to the detention centers is the, the visualization of the lines. So this line is what they tell us is that uh, people being removed and, uh, in the U.S., uh, detainees being removed in, from the U.S. in 2007, but you can also, uh, at the bottom you have a bar, where it could take you all the way back to 2012. Okay, and just in 2017, ICE removed over 220,000 people in the U.S. And another thing to consider in this visualization is that it's not um, the removal only for ports of entry, like in the border that we saw a moment ago, but airports as well. So Detroit, for instance, 26 people are removed in 2017. Uh, we have, um, I tried to, uh, to find um, the ones, 201 uh, people removed as well from Detroit. And Laredo, 27, 364 people, and this is uh, through the uh, port of entry by land. Uh, but we also have Alexandra International Airport, 23,439 people being removed, and this is in Louisiana. The San Isidro um, port of entry, 19,491 people being removed. And again, this is just 2017. This still is happening. This still is going on. So, again, you can explore different uh, visualizations in Volume 2 because Volume 2 is, it was uh, following the money, you know, where, uh, how is uh, this detention centers and immigration system is being kept, right? It's being sustained by corporations, by nonprofit organizations, and uh, it's disturbing to say the least. But. Um, again, I just um, wanted to talk about this particular one to see and connect from previous uh, data visualizations in terms of detentions or and also border crisis. So why is it important to visualize? Uh, another thing to, that, um, that we visualized was in this second volume was a mapping of allies. The first volume was a list of allies um, that uh, from the south of the um, U.S. border and northern border of uh, Mexico. So, and we had a list that you can see here as well, right? So this is how we started, placing all the names and information, phone numbers and emails specifically, uh, where you could get, where people could go and find more uh, information of uh, different organizations that were helping the immigrants uh, in either side of the border. But in the second volume, it was brought to our attention when we started, when it, when it was open for, you know, for others to collaborate, uh, and the people collaborating the specific uh, data brought to our attention that, hey, we should include as well other organizations and um, centers that are being uh, opened and are offering aid to, to immigrants also in the south of Mexico, right, throughout the whole territory, as well in the U.S. So that's what it was, um, this is what you're looking at. You're looking at more, that you, uh, more locations of places that are, are being open as we speak as well uh, because of the demand, because of the necessity and that is still going on uh, in this uh, particular um, uh, situation where people are uh, still migrating to the U.S. seeking asylum and, uh, uh, in essence, refugees. And the interesting thing is that in the second volume, uh, for instance, Dream in Mexico is one of the most recent ones that, be, that was open, Otros Dreamers in Acción. So it's linked to things that also have uh, in, uh, that are related to the U.S. in terms of immigration, like the Dreamers, right, within the U.S but then that we started to noticing that they were at risk as well and facing deportation as well with this new um, administration. And uh, New Comienzos will be another one that 
uh, uh, opened recently as well to aid immigrants uh, who need of either shelter, information, um, or just you know um, a place to to stay for a moment. So. Why is it important to visualize the global north and the global south? This uh, allies visualization became a digital map. And again, in order to locate the centers, nonprofit organizations and institutions that offer different forms of aid to immigrants and deportees. And uh, we noticed that uh, also that by doing this, um, we had to communicate, not only look through the internet, but communicate with these organizations because at times the information was not available online, you know, but we knew that they were there. So that's another thing that we noticed that uh, the limitations as well in terms of the access. Uh, so we wanted to provide this list for, uh, to, for people to have a place to start uh, the search, you know, in those terms as well. And, um, let me go back to the slide. Okay. There we go. So these are the visualizations that I just talked about. And let me see. Not, I'm not used to anymore to the PC. Okay. So and to summarize a bit uh, in terms of uh, Borderlands Archives cartography and torn apart, how does social justice in DH look like? Uh, well, but back builds and bridges with the aim of new interpretations of the past for a deeper understanding of the present in order to challenge toxic discourses. While torn apart separados is a resource uh, to uh, build upon uh, for those committed to documenting the current migration flows uh, of the United States and its immigration policies. And something that I forgot to mention about Torn Apart is that it's not over, it's not done, you know. It's a, uh, a project that is whoever is willing to take over for the third chapter for volume three is more than welcome to continue that, um, that research, to continue gathering more data. And, uh, Again, these are different practices and forms of collaborations that are much needed in terms of social justice. So Torn Apart, um, um, it's also a, um, just, just, like, uh, just like Torn Apart Borderlands Archives cartography, cartography as well, uh, it's in terms open to collaborations in the future because of the amount of uh, data and research that is required. And coming up, because we don't have enough to do, <laughs> there's too little, right? There's plenty of time to do more things. Uh, coming up is United Fronteras. So this is another collaborative project uh, that uh, Celia and I are also part of, but, and uh, it has us very excited because it's um, the, the, the people, who, uh, the team is composed of many fronterizos and transfronterizos. So it has us very excited. And this project, um, what it does, it emerges as a, a from out of back and torn apart in, in the sense of post-colonial digital humanities practices that have been mentioned. And uh, it maintains, it will maintain a digital record of active and inactive projects about global borderlands and raise questions such as, what do we understand as the digital records in various borderlands? So stay tuned for the call for collaboration. This is coming soon. And just to close, um, what Back and Torn Apart and the forthcoming United Frontera projects have in common is that they emerge from a personal stand against political issues. See the value of local experiences in global uh, perspectives and find in DH alternative forms of activism. Thank you.
Thank you so much for that. Um, we have a few minutes left for questions, and we have folks running microphones. So if there are questions, um, please raise your hand, and a mic will come to you. There's one up here. Um, and I'm going to let you all moderate, OK? Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Is this working? Oh, okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I have a question uh, about for either of you about Torn Apart Separados, which is such an incredible um, project. I've been really struck by the language and the rhetoric that's used on the site and in the mapping. For instance, when you were showing the um, visualization of the ports of entry, that it's called the trap, and it seems to be making this very clear polemical argument. Um, and it's making me think about Victor and Samantha's keynote yesterday about how the Native Land website is making this ar very clear argument. So I was just wondering if, if you guys could speak about how you guys thought about creating a project like this and if it was making an argument, which it seems to be making an argument to me, but um, from the sort of small scale decisions about how you were naming the different visualizations to uh, maybe some larger scale decisions about uh, how you were approaching the, the map. I think you have your, phone, oh. your microphone on. Yeah. OK, so I think um, that's a great point, because um, together with the team, a very creative team, <laughs> um, we thought about not replicating the same rhetoric. So the names of the visualizations were very critical when we were deciding about the names in order to make people think about what they were looking at and for going more in depth into a visualization and not just put, this is the US-Mexico border. It's more about what it's representing that US-Mexico border in this border crisis or in this immigration issue. The other issues, for example, lines, lines, it's making lines in people, right? It's not just they're deporting, they're affecting their lives. And it's like a scar, right? Merida abierta in the people, a scar. So it was that issue about thinking more about the representation of a visualization, but to send a message to make us conscious about what was going on. So that was more of about the titles. And as Mayra mentioned, the title with Torn Apart, Torn Apart was an issue because we were going into that trap and it, we were deciding that the name was going to be Frontera Crisis. We're like, no, we cannot decide on do, putting that title to the project because then we're going replicating the same discourse that it's on the news and that it's happening. As well as everything that was visualized, a lot of visualizations didn't came out because of the same thing. There was not enough information in order to put it out there. Since everything is in a website, you have to be really careful about that. Um, my question is, can you talk more about uh, the technical aspect in terms of uh, some getting or collecting public data? Well, that, uh, that was the, so we worked for a week on the project itself. But uh, each one of us were you know, already, in a way, gathering some data in terms of what was going on because of what we were hearing in the news. Uh, so by the time we got the team together, there was uh, enough data to, and still, and we had to search for more data to corroborate information and everything. But uh, it was the first thing to think about uh, in, in terms of Toronto Part is what was the what was going to be the main focus of this project, right? Because there was so much going on. So for us, it was uh, it started with the children. It's the, the, the detention centers. Like, what is going on in reality? Where are they? What is happening? Because there was nothing being told about that, right? So it's just hearing the news, alarming news about you know they're lost. They're they're. Um, they, like if they were not located anywhere, you know, uh, within, uh, within um, the system. 
So it was to, to focus on one particular uh, thing, which was that, the detention centers. And from that, it helped to uh, focus as well the research in terms of data. Because like I said, there was so much that we had to work on the second volume and still can work on a third and fourth volume. There's so much that, we, that can be explored. Uh, but it was, again, uh, exploring the open source uh, data that was out there. Um, because uh, again, uh, the immediacy of the, of the project, we needed that information um, uh, to be available as soon as possible and make sense of what was going on. So it was searching through those open sources, you know, that, um, like I mentioned, some uh, ICE facilities and uh, CBP sites, which is Custom Border Patrol sites, um, ICE detainee hearings. So anything we could get our hands on that would guide us or give us some type of information, that was uh, mostly our objective. And then within that week, uh, it was doing that, but also given context, while also interpreting the data, while also visualizing the data. But having uh, that collaboration, you know, and also using our skills, different, we all had different skills that we put together that made this uh, possible in reality. It was a lot of work. It was, you know, uh, sleepless nights uh, for many reasons um, because that is also, there was also another component of it, which is the emotional labor. Right, most of the team uh, is somehow related to this type of situations. Most of us are immigrants uh, from different countries, um, so of course we can compare our experiences to what um, the, um, the families and the children were going through. Um, but we knew that there was something that we need, we have to do because of that, because there was something missing in the news. There was something missing that was misleading the information and we were frustrated by it. So yes, it was the first thing to do was go to the open sources, organizing them, put our skills in practice, you know, our academic formation, and, uh, and, and also looking at archives because we had to also be familiar with, uh, with the border itself, the, the, the system, the policies, and so on and so forth to make sense of this context. So. Um, yeah, there's some of the things as to how we approach uh, the data and how we worked or managed that information. We have time for about one more question, one or two. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was I had a question about the Separados project. Um, it was really nice to see all of the maps. And did you also use GIS for that? Yes, it was um, created through LeafFit. Oh, okay. Um, all of the visualizations were created through LeafFit. Oh, okay. Um, for the maps, are researchers able to download the data to get yes. the shape files? Um, well, mm -hmm. it was available um, through, um, we put it on GitHub, but there's an issue downloading the data. Oh, okay. So probably you will have to to send an email if you're interested on the data to torn apart separados mm -hmm. at Gmail and request the data and we can send it to you in order for you to continue working on it. Oh, okay. It was available, but there were some issues that it, it cannot be downloaded. Oh, okay. And then I just wanted to get the link for the different projects. I think I just got one. Um, when Which you were, one? I wanted to ask if there's different links for the projects that you mentioned, because I just got the first one. Oh, for the data? Um, or? Like, f I got your link for. Um, back? back. For oh, for torn apart, just look yeah. torn apart separados, mm -hmm. and that's the first thing it's going to come up when oh, okay. you look for it on Google. Okay, thank yeah. you. And also, that's another thing um, that I forgot to mention that all data, it's, it's there. It's, on the, it's on, the, on the site. You, in terms of um, the open sources that we use, uh, the, the different. Uh, digital components that were used, everything is there. And if you have any questions or would like to do the third volume, uh, you can go ahead and contact us to, through the email and we are more gladly to help and give you any information that you might need. And a quick note, Borderlands Archives Cartography has a great Twitter feed, so you can follow it there as well. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you both for the great presentation. Very exciting project. Um, could you, would you be willing to give a preview or talk a little bit about what you're hoping to accomplish with the Fronteras project and what that might look like? Yeah, so what um, United Fronteras looked like, it's putting together what we learned during BAC, that we were trying to give a context to newspapers. And what we found out is that we saw that there's a lot of projects out there that are using digital companions in order to document the borderlands in different perspectives. And when we started looking at those, we were like, this is um, how it was like, oh, this is digital humanities and probably those projects, they don't conceive themselves as digital humanities or they're using digital components but it's not um, considered sometimes um, digital components. So we started gathering those um, projects and we were like, why don't we get a group of people that can Get to get we, we get together and start talking about uh, and start collecting more projects about the borderlands since pre-colonial times to the present, and we have been working together on that for a year, in which we have been it, all these uh, people are from different universities, from different experiences from the borderlands. Some, some were born there, some just cross some arrive there in certain times, but all of them are committed in a certain way to these issues. Um, they're from different disciplines, so they see the border and these issues from different perspectives. Um, not all of them are familiar to digital humanities, and I think that's what has been brought together, is that we are learning different things, and we have been um, contributing in different perspectives. So as we have been getting together through Telegram and Skype, we have been organizing this um, slow because it's also a non-granted project. It's more about, for us, it's a commitment to learn, to, to learn more about different projects and uh, also about visualizing. We're starting with the US-Mexico borderland to visualize all the projects from the US-Mexico borderlands in order to document this area through projects. So there are some projects that document literature, art, music, archives, so it's different perspectives, and you will learn this area through these projects. Um, others, um, as we move forward, we're gonna be moving to other borderlands with people that it's familiar to those areas. And this idea came up with the projects that we have been gathering in back, but also um, related to the project that Alex Hill directed around DH in 80 days, in which he mapped different projects um, all around the world. So this is the idea of mapping the different projects that have been created throughout the borderlands. <laughs> 